Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our conversation about the Americans with Disabilities Act. My name is Tom Armstrong, and we're going to go through some introductions here in a few mo moments, but I am going to be your moderator for the day. Um, and we want to welcome all of you. We want to welcome our panelists. Uh, we're going to, as I mentioned, we're going to go through introductions momentarily, but we want to welcome all of you our audience um, who is joining us today. It's wonderful. We know we have a lot of people today and we are just thrilled that you're going to be part of this conversation about the Americans with Disabilities Act. So um, before we jump into the introductions, what is the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA? Um, just a, a brief couple words about that because I don't wanna steal thunder from our impressive panel but the ADA um, was founded, um, was signed on July 26th of 1990. And basically in a few words, it made it possible for everybody with a disability to have a life of freedom and equality. Um, signed into law by President George Bush, um, again in 1990. Um, and it was really passed with overwhelming bipartisan um, congressional support. It was the first uh, comprehensive declaration of equality for people with disabilities. So the ADA protects the rights of people with disabilities um, in all aspects of employment, public service, as transportation, um, guaranteeing access to private establishments such as and places of accommodation such as restaurants, stores, hotels, and commercial buildings. So why is the ADA important? Well, there are 61 million Americans who have a disability. That probably makes it important right there, but it's nearly one in four, re uh, one in four residents of the United States have a disability. Um, and this number is gonna continue to grow as um, part of our population acquires disabilities um, because of aging or disabilities incurred in combat for our veterans. So um, that's just a little bit of an overview um, on that. And so I want to want to jump into the introductions now as mentioned. So we have we have an, a, a great panel with us today, um, Dr. Rory Cooper and I'm going to just go down the list and then we're going to come back and talk about each of the panels and have them do a little more of an introduction. Chaz Callum, Dr. Jonathan Duvall, Elizabeth Powers, Shelby Van Blit, and Andrea Sundaram. So Dr. Cooper, um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to say a few words about Dr. Cooper and then I'm going to really let him tell us a little bit more um, about himself on this. But Dr. Cooper um, is the founding director of the Human Engineering Research Laboratory, uh, VA Pittsburgh Healthcare System. Um, among many things on, on Dr. Cooper's resume, he has over 25 patents awarded or pending. Um, Dr. Cooper has served on a federal advisory committee for the Department of Defense, Veterans Affairs, and Health and Human Services. And one thing that I thought was terrific um, that I've always been so impressed with. Dr. Cooper, an Army veteran with a spinal cord injury, won a bronze medal in the Paralympic Games in Seoul, South Korea in 1988. So welcome, Dr. Cooper. And what else would you like to share with the audience about your distinguished background, please? Well, Tom, thank you for that introduction and thank you for moderating our panel today. It's a, it's a pleasure to be part of this. Um, I think you've done a good job. I'm also a distinguished professor at the University of Pittsburgh and the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences with appointments also in the School of Engineering and School of Medicine. And um, I uh, also currently serve on an advisory panel for the National Science Foundation and for the Department of the Army. So it's a pleasure to be here and I'm happy to tell you a little bit about uh, some of my experiences uh, pre and post ADA when the opportunity arises. Okay, thank you. So next, I'd like to, um, we'd like to hear from Chaz Kellum. And Chaz and I actually have known each other for a number of years. Uh, Chaz and I go back to 2008. Uh, Chaz, when I first met Chaz, he was the manager of diversity for the Pittsburgh Pirate Baseball Club. 
And now, as of 2018, Chaz has joined us at Pitt as the director of PitServe. So Chaz, anything else that we can, we can share with the audience about your wonderful background? Um, I just want to take a moment just to simply say thank you. Thank you, Tom, for moderating. I'm excited to be part of such an amazing um, panel today to share some information and insight, as well as personal experience uh, about uh, being an individual with a disability. Um, I'm just proud to be part of the Pitt family, um, representing the, the Division of Student Affairs, and uh, really excited that the conference thus far has been phenomenal, mm -hmm. and I'm just thrilled to be part of it. So thanks, Tom, for facilitating, and looking forward to getting deep into the discussion. Thank you, Chaz. Appreciate it. Next on our list is Dr. Jonathan Duvall. Um, hello, Jonathan. And, um, and Jonathan is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Pittsburgh Human Engineering Research Laboratories. Um, one of the things that was very impressive to me on, um, on John's bio was he has the co-founded co PathView, P-A-T-H-V-U, PathView, which evaluates and maps sidewalks and other pedestrian pathways for accessibility. So John, would you like to expand on that or other things that you'd like to share with us? Uh, sure. Um, so um, I, I've been at Pitt basically, basically since 2004. I did my bachelor's, master's, and PhD um, all at Pitt. Um, I started at Pitt in 2004. Like I said, before I had a disability, I actually acquired my disability in 2007 when I was a mm. junior um, mm. as an undergraduate. So um, I've been at Pitt pre and post having a disability. Um, and yeah, I've worked um, with Dr. Cooper in his research lab and uh, co-founded PathView and um, just enjoy working on assistive technology and, and trying to improve accessibility and uh, inclusion in all aspects of uh, the university and society in general. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. Um, next on our list is Elizabeth Powers, and Libby and I have known each other. We have mutual friends that actually introduced us um, to each other back in 2016. Uh, Libby is a full-time research assistant at um, the Human Engineering Research Laboratory, and she's a lifelong active um, advocate and activist with the disability community in Pittsburgh. Libby, welcome, and please share anything else that you'd like. Thanks, Tom, for uh, moderating our panel today. Um, I'm happy to join this esteemed panel of individuals. Um, my passion for advocating and activism for dis the disability community stems way back from childhood, where I strongly advocated and um, participated in um, inclusion activities with persons with disabilities from a very young age and have always strived to help the greater community understand the basic needs and desires of individuals with disabilities and how they desire to be included and um, honored as valuable human citizens um, who want to contribute and be a part of the conversation. So I'm happy to be here today. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Libby. So Shelby, um, we have Shelby next and Shelby is a junior undergraduate neuroscience and French major at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Shelby, welcome and please share some other things about yourself. Hello, uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so I'm relatively new to uh, disability activism on such a large scale. I do a lot of um, activism with like awareness and neuromuscular diseases like the one I have. Uh, I've used an electric wheelchair since I was two years old. So I'm definitely very familiar with like um, physical barriers that people with disabilities face when it comes to entering buildings and other such accommodations. So um, my main goal at the University of Pittsburgh is definitely to get a lot more into activism and help our city strive for a higher level of diversity and inclusion. Awesome. Thank you so much. We appreciate that, Shelby. And last on our panel is Andrea. And Andrea is 
currently a PhD student at the Rehab Science and Technology um, at the University of Pittsburgh Human Engineering Research Lab as well. So welcome aboard and uh, please share anything else that you would Give like. Me. So, um, well, uh, th thanks Tom for that introduction and for moderating the, sure. um, this uh, panel. And, and uh, as, uh, as all of you may have heard that um, many of us are from the human engineering research labs. And so these, uh, this esteemed panel is also most of them are my friends and colleagues and Dr. Cooper is my advisor. So I had best say that it is an esteemed panel. Uh, I am uh, like Dr. Cooper, I'm a bit older than some of the rest of the panelists, although uh, not quite in his cohort. So uh, I've been around since before the ADA, uh, although I was in elementary school when it was passed. And uh, yes. I, I guess the interesting thing is that I've been um, visually impaired since age five, and then I acquired a spinal cord injury at age 29. So I have, uh, I've seen disability from a couple of different perspectives. Great. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. So um, before we jump into the, to the meat of this session today with the questions, I, uh, just a little bit about myself. Um, as I mentioned before, my name is Tom Armstrong and um, I'm a recruiter in the talent acquisition um, team at, out of the Office of Human Resources at the University of Pittsburgh. My position is somewhat unique in that I'm actually employed by Blind and Vision Rehabilitation Services of Pittsburgh and through a grant and contract, I was brought into Pitt back in 2015. And my role is um, basically to source individuals who have a disability and also veterans um, who have an interest in working for um, the University of Pittsburgh. So that is really what my role is. And um, we are, um, we're delighted that we're going to be back for fiscal year 21 and remaining here. And, um, and so this, the project, by the way, the name of the project is called the Career Transition Project. So, um, so that's a little bit about me there. So we wanna thank you again. And um, so now I'd like to jump into really the meat of things here. Um, and um, as we indicated that the ADA is 30 years old, 30 years young, um, so Dr. Cooper, I'd like to start with you, if I could, please. If you could tell us what life was like before the ADA um, was signed in uh, passage. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, life was actually rather difficult prior to the ADA being signed. Uh, people with disabilities, believe it or not, we didn't have the right to um, or ability to rent a car if you needed adaptive vehicle modifications. You um, couldn't find housing. You, um, there were, uh, because, and you, um, I oftentimes would have to go to uh, restaurants through the, enter through the kitchen if you could get in at all. Uh, traveling was um, very, very difficult, if not impossible, because there weren't accessible hotel rooms to stay in. And, um, in flying, which remains still to be a challenge, but at the time airlines could deny you to fly. And a lot of people um, early on couldn't even go to school uh, because schools weren't accessible and they didn't provide uh, programming for people with disabilities. Uh, in my own case, for example, I had to find people to uh, uh, carry me upstairs to get into laboratories and and uh, assist me. Uh, uh, laboratory equipment was all designed for standing height and things like that. And so it was, uh, it was extremely challenging. It was also very difficult to get any form of, of credit, which meant it was difficult to advance. And for that matter, such civic responsibilities as, as voting polling places weren't accessible. And at the time, uh, in many states, you um, it wasn't a guarantee that you could request an absentee ballot. Uh, so we've come a long ways in those areas. I think we're still significantly challenged in changing people's attitudes to be more inclusive and um, for securing employment. Uh, it's still 
uh, extremely difficult. And there's a high unemployment rate among people with disabilities. But we have come a long, long ways. Many of those problems I mentioned, have, I wouldn't say have been resolved, but they've uh, vastly improved. Uh, as Paul Hanlon noted in his uh, op-ed piece in the Post-Gazette last week, you know, there's still a number of businesses and locations that are remain inaccessible, you know, specifically if there's a, maybe a one or two step entrances. And uh, now as we transition, for example, to on-demand transportation and perhaps eventually self-driving cars, we also need to be careful that those are inclusive tools. Um, also in communications, you know, they had the um, telecommunication devices for the deaf or TDDs as they're commonly known um, and relay pro and relay systems as well. But such technologies as smartphones and texting have also had a tremendous benefit. Um, although we have to be careful that our why a uh, web and other communications remain accessible to the widest possible population of people. So um, a lot of work still to do, uh, but a lot of progress has been made uh, in the last 30 years. Thank you, Tom. Indeed. Thank you so much, Dr. Cooper. Okay, next question that I'd like to open up to, to everybody is how has the Americans with Disabilities Act, again, ADA, affected your life personally? So um, again, I, I'm going to leave this kind of open to anybody that wants to start, um, and we'll just kind of go down the line. Thanks, Tom, for the question. Um, real quick, I think it's important to know that you know we did celebrate um, the ADA turning 30 this year, and, and that's a, a success, as Dr. Cooper just mentioned. Um, as, a, as a younger individual, I guess, as, as age has been talked about, I'm a child um, that grew up with the ADA. So um, I, I recognize and appreciate that I have had the opportunity to grow up with the ADA providing me access to true independence, and I'm very appreciative of that, appreciative of that. It has definitely positively impacted uh, my opportunities. Um, I also think, you know, thinking about things like local school access and being able to go to colleges of our choice and being able to um, be in a world and a society that's inclusive, the ADA provided those opportunities for, for, for me and for, for folks um, now. We do have some work to do. So I just wanted to mention that it's important that we recognize where we've come, celebrate 30 years, but also we keep our foot down on the gas pedal to, or a hand on the, on the handbrake or whatever term we want to use for driving, um, that we just keep focused on the next 30 years and working together to assure that we continue to make progress. Um, I, I can follow up uh, with Chaz there. Um, I also, you know, grew up that, uh, by the time I acquired a disability, the ADA was already 17 years old. Um, so I didn't really see what life was like before it, but knowing some of the, the history um, of society and, and of the ADA, of just thinking like once I acquired the disability, I was able to go back to college without much of a problem. Um, there was public transportation in and around the city um, until I was able to get a vehicle adapted I could drive. Um, just getting into most uh, facilities, um, you know, wasn't a problem for me. There, there are still several around Pittsburgh that, you know, have steps or uh, stairs that I can't get into. Um, but the majority of businesses I'm, I'm able to get into and do my shopping at restaurants and everything. So um, I, I think it's definitely made acquiring a disability a lot less hard than it would have been if I would have acquired a disability um, prior to the ADA. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Anybody else? Shelby? Yeah, so I'm only 20 years old, so I guess I'm pretty young. Um, so I guess I can explain what it's like growing up with the ADA. Um, thanks to the ADA, I was integrated fully into mainstream school. Um, by high school, I was pretty well known in my school. I was the vice president of the National Honor Society. 
uh, captain of the debate team, the typical high school nerd, but without the ADA, I wouldn't have been able to be as involved as I was. And um, the ADA has also given me the opportunity to move five hours away from my family, to go to the University of Pittsburgh, hire my own care, um, manage through a nursing agency, and actually be able to attend classes considering how most of the buildings at Pitt are fully accessible as well as the transportation. So it's kind of hard to imagine what it would have been like for me to grow up without the ADA because I do feel like it's given me the opportunities that I've had. Thank you, Shelby. Anybody else would like to add into that question? Again, how has the ADA affected your life? Well, Tom, this is Rory again. Yeah. I think yes. one of the things that it's funny how little things make a big difference. Uh, last summer, the um, a ramp was added to the cathedral, yes. which made it possible, the Cathedral of Learning, to get to uh, Dr. Rudenbar's and Dr. Kathy Humphrey's um, offices mm -hmm. and actually made some of the um, international heritage classrooms accessible for the first time. Yes. So, and even now it's pretty amazing. Plus the fact that you're at Pitt is, uh, is, an, it is a uh, result of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, Andrea? Yeah, unmute. Uh, yes, so um, I, think it's, I think it's interesting that uh, at least in theory, the um, the educational institutions uh, having, you know, in that they receive federal funding and so forth, that they should have been accessible uh, before the ADA. And uh, as Dr. Cooper already pointed out in his introduction, such was not the case, or at least not as much the case as it should have been. And uh, as, as I said, that I, I went through, um, and I, I was the first legally blind person who went through my uh mm -hmm. who went through my school system and and so i found out a lot of things on the way and um and that was before the ada and things were supposed to be accessible but uh and then the ada comes along and that really is supposed to open up the rest yes. of life to us and i do remember that the first job uh, for which i had an interview upon graduation from college, which was 2002, uh, the interview was going great until they found out that, oh, well, you can't, uh, you don't, you can't drive. And so you can't drive around between our various locations, um, which were all within half an hour of each other. Well, I guess this job isn't really going to work out. So the ADA, uh, I think one of the, one of the problems is that, um, you know, maybe they weren't fully aware of what their responsibilities were. And, uh, I, uh, I guess I wasn't fully aware or willing to, to push them on it. But uh, I think we've come a long way since yes. then in terms of uh, employers knowing what, uh, what accommodations might, uh, might be reasonable to make. For the audience, what uh, okay. Andrea is referring to is Section 504 of the Rehab Act of 1973 which uh, was signed into the law. Um, the regulations were first implemented starting in 1977 after the largest sit-in of a federal building uh, mm -hmm. at that time in history by a group of people with disabilities who um, wanted to see that the, it be implemented mm -hmm. so that uh, education and those organizations receiving funds from the federal government would become accessible. And that was the uh, precursor in many ways to the Americans with Disabilities Act, which expanded that those rights to both the public and private sector. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and before I actually move on to the next question, I wanna, I, I also, I was remiss um, to mention a shout out really to Heather who's overseeing our chat and Matt who's taking care of our technology today. So thanks to both of you as well. So. To our audience members, please um, feel free to let us know if you have questions or comments. And um, you know, Heather will be, um, like I said, overseeing that part of things in the chat room. So 
Um, okay, our next question for our panel. Um, do you have a role model or a leader, I guess you could say, with disabilities that has influenced your life? Um, so again, the question, do you have a role model or a leader um, with a disability who has influenced you? So I'll, maybe I'll take sure. the lead here. This sure. is Rory. Um, yeah. I would have to say that would be Judy Human in my mind. Um, I first met Judy Human in um, 1981. Uh, for those who don't know Judy, Judy's one of the authors of the Americans with Disabilities Act. She was actually one of the organizers of the sit-in in 1977 for the Rehab Act of 1973. And um, you can learn a lot more about Judy from the documentary um, Crip Camp or reading her autobiography, Being Human. Uh, Judy and I met uh, in California through a mutual friend and she uh, encouraged me as a, as a veteran and a person with, who used a wheelchair as a result of an accident to um, get engaged not only in my education, but using it to uh, create a better world for people with disabilities. And uh, Judy is a, a remarkable person who has made many, many positive contributions um, for the United States and the, and the world for that matter. I'll, I'll follow up on that. Uh, I was also gonna mention Judy Human. I, I've had the chance to meet her a few times. Um, I'd also, you know, being somebody that, that works with Dr. Cooper, I'd, I'd say he's one of um, a role model and a, a leader um, for the younger generation. Um, also, uh, Kate Seelman, who used to be a professor at the University of Pittsburgh and has since semi-retired. Um, she was part of Judy Human's uh, group um, and led uh, the National Institute of uh, Rehabilitation and Disability I can't remember what that stands for, Dr. Cooper. National, the National, National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research. Right. Um, and now it includes independent living as well. So they changed the name. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, and also Ed Roberts, who was one of the big uh, people pushing for the passage of the ADA. Um, and uh, another person that I've got to know pretty well is Larry Roffey, who was the chair of the Access Board for several years. And, uh, and the Access Board is the uh, federal agency that uh, puts forth uh, standards for accessibility um, to what is considered accessible. Um, so there, there's a lot of people that I've seen um, it kind of in my short time in, in disability advocacy that I uh, look up to and, and wanna kind of carry on the torch as we go forward. Thank you. Um, okay, well, uh... yeah, shall we? So the way I got into activism was kind of different. Um, if you've seen the movie Curb Camp, we actually had an equivalent somewhat to that called Muscular Dystrophy Association Camp. It was a summer camp that was like a week long and um, me and other people with muscular dystrophy varying like forms of disability, like along with like how much we could do, like physical disability, sorry. Um, but we actually learned from each other, like what it was like living independently and it was kind of like a drug, like that freedom that we felt. And the older campers, um, most notably, he wasn't as much in the camps, um, but his name is Shane Burkaw. He became an author. He's from my area. He has spinal muscular atrophy, which is similar to what I have. And he's done a lot of social media advocacy. There's other people from my area and all across the country with muscular dystrophy who like in the same way as me, learned independence from that summer camp and just went on to do incredible things in activism. And those are the people I look up to just because they're like, they've been through what I've been through. And unfortunately, uh, with the disease I have, a lot of them have passed away, but even the short time they had on this earth, they did incredible things. So I could only hope to be as um, great in activism as they have been. Thank you. Chaz? Great question, Tom. Um, thank you for asking. And I think when I, when I think about the leader and role models, um, I often take my motivation, my encouragement, my inspiration from 
um, people all around me, right? So I'm inspired by the work that Dr. Dr. Mm -hmm. Cooper's doing. I'm inspired by seeing the growth in folks like Libby and Shelby. So I take my inspiration. I'm, in, I'm motivated, encouraged, and excited by all types of folks around me. Um, we have some great people locally mm -hmm. um, that are doing major work, um, but there are also some folk that are everyday heroes and champions. So an example of an everyday hero in my mind is John Sakura. And John uh, is an is a athlete that uh, has also gone to the Olympics and wheelchair basketball. Mm -hmm. And John's method is really uh, inspiring, motivating, encouraging, and maximizing uh, a person's abilities uh, making sure that they give all of their effort, what, what, whatever task that they may be doing. And he really pushes uh, an individual to, to pursue their own level of happiness and independence. And I'm, I appreciate John. I met him at a very young age and at the time, uh, couldn't couldn't shoot a, a basketball through a hoop that's for anything and through practice and self-determination and encouragement and motivation and positive reinforcement, John uh, was able to increase my ability and skill. And, and I use basketball as just a, a form of, of life, right? It's the same concept as just keep trying, keep pushing through. You're gonna have some challenges and obstacles, but keep pushing through. So I'm grateful, motivated, and encouraged for folks like John and the many others throughout our region that continue to do the work each and every day. Thank you so much. Andrea, would, anything that you would like to add in? Yes. So um, the um, the summer after I graduated from high school, I went to the uh, convention of the the National Federation of the Blind, and uh, I I I kind of didn't. I probably wouldn't have gone otherwise. Then they uh, they offered me a scholarship, and one of the requirements was that I go. And the, I did meet. Um, I met a lot of a lot of people there who. Um, uh, two of them actually who inspired me uh were adrian ash who uh, she passed away a few years ago but she was a professor of bioethics at wellesley and in fact she was um her um, one of her topics of interest was uh about um people who might want to um, have abortions to uh, uh after getting information back that their um that the fetus uh, has uh disability and um but I, I got to be good friends with adrian and then also another one uh, was in my cohort of scholarship recipients um her name's carla gilbride and she is now a lawyer who does a lot of um public interest uh law she did disability law for a while but um uh has expanded out into into other things and i got to know her quite well as well and then, of course, I got to hurl after my after acquiring the spinal cord injury, and I was around Dr. Cooper and Dr. Duval and uh, Brandon Daveler, another recent uh, well, now Dr. Daveler, he recently graduated, and so uh, these uh, these fellows taught me a lot about life with a spinal cord injury, which was new to me. Thank you so much. Appreciate your story there, Libby. I think it's interesting in that I also relate to Chaz's response in that I take the role model and uh, kind of leader perspective of those around me. Um, and I was fortunate to, enough to grow up with a, another family member who had a similar type of disability that I do and who is extremely successful and um, everything um, that she does because she works for um, Kellogg as a global communications uh, senior VP. And I've really taken um, kind of looking up to her and looking up to see how much she has achieved and accomplished in her life that, um, it kind of motivated me and pushes me to do better and to do more. Um, and also to acknowledge my differences with having a disability, but also to strive for a more inclusive environment that where disability is just a word 
and not a de- um, definition of a person. Thank you, Libby. Okay, the next question that I'd like to put on to our panel, um, what are some of the biggest challenges um, that people face still with disabilities? So yes, the biggest challenges that still people I'm sorry, still face people with disabilities. So, uh, Jonathan, why don't you start? You're on. Yeah, I I think we might have lost Dr. Cooper. At least I don't see his name still there. Um, But I I think the biggest thing that we we still see that hasn't changed much, um, passing of the ADA, is the employment of people with disabilities, um, whether that's just uh, unemployment rate, meaning that they're trying to find jobs, but because the um, the employer is essentially um, uh, not hiring them because they have a disability and discriminating, even though it's hard to prove. Um, but also the um, uh, participation rate of people with disabilities in employment um, is still relatively low. And part of that can be because of afraid of losing some of their, either their health care or um, some other benefits that are financially based. <laughs> Excuse me. So that's still um, an issue um, that that al- also has a lot of other ramifications as well, um, from just amassing wealth and you know uh, sending it on to their children. It, it's hard. So um, they their children then tend to grow up poor as well. Um, there's also uh, marriage rights that be similar to that because um, if somebody with a disability is getting services and then they get married, the income from their spouse is, is added to theirs and so they can lose their services simply by getting married. Um, and so there's, those are two of the biggest ones that I still see, um, but there's, there, there's other ones um, for certain disabilities that, that are also still a challenge that... Um, need to need to be solved. Thank you so much. Uh, this is Dr. Cooper. I'm back again. Yes. Um, sorry about that. Actually, I'm surprised, John, you didn't bring up the fact that there's challenges for graduate students that uh, you, um, if you get a fellowship, it has to be limited or it affects uh, ability to receive support for attendant care service or other services from the state. Um, that's something that certainly needs to be changed um, in order to uh, allow people with disabilities to pursue education where they can get advancement. Yes. Yeah. I think the, the other challenge too um, that we often face is having a seat at the table, Tom, and just being invited to the conversation and on the initial and the planning process is of things. Oftentimes we're either brought um, on towards the end of um, the project or um, not thought of as all at all to um, have a voice at the table for what um, accessibility and inclusion needs that we acquire um and that's a problem i think that um is slowly being fixed with Mm -hmm. um increased diversity and inclusion practices but we still have a long ways to go to become somebody who is invited to the table as a forethought instead of an afterthought yes excellent point thank you Tom, I think it's important to note that um, the, the, the ADA is a piece of legislation that has helped us all, um, but we have to continue to be disruptive. We continue to have to be boisterous. Um, this, this aligns with one of the questions we were asked um, in, in the question box, but we have to continue to use our voice. We have to continue to be disruptive. We have to continue to use our resources to continue to push change. We cannot be content just because the ADA is around, right? We have to continue to use our resources to push through and it has to be done collectively, right? We need individuals outside of the disability community to support our work. We have to understand the intersection of disability with everyday life. 
Disability, as mentioned by some of the panelists, is one of those things that can affect anyone at any point in their lives. Yes. And, and because of that, we all have to be aware of this topic and do our part to make sure that we have change. We also cannot forget that just because we have disabilities, we have other things, other identities that make us who we are. As a black man, I have challenges that impact me because of my race, because of my religious stance, because of my political stance, and disability is an element that overlaps and combat, connects many of those other identities. So I think at some point that we continue to talk about those, raise awareness of those, but we need each other and the support of uh, non-disabled communities to continue to push forward for progress and change. Thank you, Chaz. Thank you. Shelby? Um, hi, uh, just to like reiterate um, what everyone else has been saying, like the ADA is a piece of legislation in a sense, but I've noticed specifically like anywhere I go, um, there are still businesses that aren't accessible. There are still um, like public places that aren't entirely accessible. So like we have the laws in place. I think a big step would be going the next step to enforce them. And of course, all of the other issues that have been brought up, I definitely agree with that as well. Thank you. Andrea? So uh, I, I don't want to, um, so I, I think that the other panelists have covered a lot of it, and but leading from what Shelby was saying that uh, in terms of enforcement, the only way to enforce um, compliance with the with the ADA is to file a lawsuit. So there's no, uh, there's no other mechanism. Um, well, I guess you can start with the EEOC if it's an employment thing. But um, for instance, if a uh, if a business doesn't want to have a ramp at the front, you can ask nicely, and otherwise you can sue. And there is um, John. I'm sure knows uh, more more about this, but there there are people. Um, there's a particular uh, individual who um, made it her mission to go in, around Oakland and, and threaten or sue businesses in order to make them accessible. And so that's some of what we have to do. As Chaz said, you have to be a little bit boisterous. There used to be something called the, um, the ramp crawl where people in wheelchairs went around and went to all the accessible bars in, in Oakland. And that was a fun time, but I thought that it might have been equally uh, useful or more useful that we would all congregate outside of one that is not accessible to show them the business that they're losing. Thank you so much for that. Okay, moving on to our next question. How can Pitt, how can the University of Pittsburgh become more accessible and and an inclusive community for people with disabilities? Um, I think the step that they have like with forming this committee, it's a great step because now that they have us together, we can express the issues we've been facing, relay that to them and work with them for a solution. So I think this committee in general is a great first step that Pitt has taken towards mm -hmm. becoming more inclusive. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is Rory. I mean, one thing they need to do is hire more faculty and staff with disabilities, and um, and then do and provide scholarships for more students with disabilities, so that we can bring people in and create a critical mass of people with disabilities, so that it becomes part of a university culture and self-sustaining. Yes. Thank you. I think Pitt's doing a, a pretty good job in at least making some steps uh, to, to solving some of the issues that I've seen while I've been here. Um, there's still a few buildings that aren't, aren't accessible or aren't very accessible. Um, I know in their future plans, um, those buildings aren't going to be a part of Pitt's future. So, you know, they're, they're not real worried about fixing them because in, you know, I think they say five-year plan or 10-year plan, those buildings aren't even going to be a part of Pitt. Um, so um, that's one thing that's still a bit of a problem, but, you know, it is something that is going to be getting uh, taken care of. 
Um, another thing is that when it comes to new construction, um, they've uh, people at Pitt have worked with Dr. Cooper and I to review plans of uh, new buildings and, and new renovations to get the perspective of somebody with a disability um, to help make sure that what they're building is going to be accessible. Um, the other thing that I, I think um, we've been working with for a while is trying to get some more uh, sports and recreation um, uh, opportunities for people with disabilities at Pitt, um, whether it's uh, having the opportunity to play wheelchair basketball or um, any of the wheelchair sports yes. um, as intramural um, or competitive sports, um, or also giving uh, scholarships to people who are um, Paralympians um, in similar ways that they would give scholarships to uh, somebody coming in to play football. Um, yes. So th those are a couple things that I think Pitt could do to, to be a little bit better. Thank you so much. Others? How we can become more in inclusive and accessible at Pitt? Anything else? Anybody else want to add anything? This is Andrea. Uh, yes. I think that um, so, some of the other, we, we've been talking a lot about uh, physical accessibility, and you know, Pitt uh, is doing better at that. There, there's there are things left to do. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the issues that actually I've run into have more to do with um, accessibility of uh, content visually, especially with um, uh, related to what software is. Uh, accessible uh, what university standard software is accessible to screen readers in my case i use a combination of uh, dictation and screen reader and that that uh, that makes it difficult to use many of the software products that are um, requirements at at pit uh, and dr cooper and i have had a lot of um, trouble getting even when there are solutions there's uh, there's a lot of question about well where does the money come from to pay for such things and so i know that he has uh, been advocating that pitt sets aside some funding to pay for um, all of all sorts of disability accommodations and um, because otherwise it's well does the department pay or uh, disability resources and services has a very limited budget as well and uh, so um he might want to talk more about that uh, because he has made significant efforts toward it. Yes. I, I think Andrea makes a great point. It's not just about physical accessibility, but, you know, using so purchasing accessible software and, and websites and um, apps and other means of communicating so that uh, accessibility is done in its broadest sense. Um, also, um, I mean, I do echo that Pitt's making significant progress, and um, we have uh, obviously, have, uh, but we still have work to do. Uh, the other area is about marketing and imaging, so that we use uh, real photos of people with disabilities, for example, preferably on Pitt students and faculty and staff in Pitt materials as well. So um, it's not some sort of stock photo on the website of. Yes. of a model who doesn't have a disability, for example. Yes. Um, but, uh, you know, it takes all of us, it takes a team effort. Um, I also wanted to echo what Chad said, Chad said, you know, um, uh, being a person with a disability is only uh, a partial description, right? I'm a veteran, a husband, uh, a professor, an engineer, um, and uh, I, I've been you know, an advisor to um, senior level government officials as well. And so it's said I'm an uncle and you know, a brother. So there's all, you know, also the, the people realize that people with disabilities are, are multifaceted. I'm not defined by my disability, it's just a, it's a, uh, an aspect of my life. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
I think I think it's important that Pitt um, would invest back in a community when it comes to disability specific. So Pitt has a, does a lot of work um, through community government relations, through student affairs, and through other um, academic departments to support and give back to the community. Pittsburgh has a thriving community that supports all sorts of disability. So I would love to have Pitt invest in experts in the community, some of these nonprofit organizations, some of these experts in the community to continue to, uh, and support their work that's happening uh, at a local level. Um, Achieva, Pittsburgh Steel Willers, right. Class. I mean, there are some great nonprofits in this region that could use the financial support and the expertise um, that Pitt has to really help the missions of those organizations. Okay. Thank you. Okay, anybody else on this one? Because Chaz, you, you really, it was a good segue to our next question when you, you mentioned Pittsburgh, because I wanna know what you all think about how, um, how Pittsburgh is in terms of accessibility and inclusion as a whole on the local, our community level, our city. So I think besides the occasional business that's not accessible, um, I have encountered businesses that have a step that will bring out a ramp, um, just like a little ramp you could probably buy off of Amazon, but they went that extra step just to make sure that they could cater to the disabled community. I would just like to give a shout out to them because that is inclusion at its finest. Um, and I think like along the lines of like the whole fact that we have to file lawsuits if we want a place to become accessible it's it's not really a way to go about doing things but it's what we're forced to do at some points i feel like if there was a mechanism in which we could just promote more information wise is what needs to be done to make your business accessible maybe like on a government level provide funds to do that i think um implementing the ada would be a lot better and then the only other issue I've noticed with the city of Pittsburgh is more so an issue I've noticed kind of like all over, which is just the lack of education on how to approach people with disabilities. Unfortunately, I have been, I have had an incident where I was harassed on um, public transportation because I simply asked the bus driver to put tie downs on my electric wheelchair. And there's been other instances where I've been questioned on why I need tie downs on my chair. Um, that was when I owned a wheelchair that was very front heavy and would tip very easily and almost has tipped in on public transportation because of the tie downs not being adequate. Um, but other than that, I just feel like it's an educational issue. Just not a lot of people are aware of how to treat disabilities and how to be inclusive of individuals with disabilities. Yes, yes. thank you. Others, please. I think Pittsburgh is, as far as um, their accessibility and inclusion of individuals with disabilities, it's come a long way. But I think that there are definitely still barriers that we encounter in, within the community in Pittsburgh, such as um, the quality and the um, safety of our sidewalks and um, streets. Um, because of the, the main avenues of traveling for pedestrians and we are considered pedestrians sometimes as well, even if we are riding in our chairs. Yes. Um, and that imposes a security risk and safety risk to us if they're not in good condition. So I think we could definitely do better at um, the improvement of uh, the surroundings in Pittsburgh to make them more accessible and more inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's definitely possible. We just have to put it at the top of the list rather than at the very bottom. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Others, please. So I, I would kind of echo what Shelby said about um, some of the people's attitudes that you encounter uh, out on the streets. There's um, 
again, I think it's a, a small portion, but you definitely still do um, encounter people that um, are, you know, just rude or discriminatory or, or anything like that. Um, but in terms of the physical accessibility, I think it's, it's done a pretty good job for, especially for a city that's built on so many hills. Um, there's a city county task force on disabilities that helps, um, advise the, uh, um, the, uh, mayor and the, uh, county executive on, uh, issues related to disabilities. Um, and I think that that's really helpful because one of the things that, um, I, I think, it still presents a challenge is when something new comes around and the the designers or or the people in charge didn't think of disabilities when they created it um you know things like ride sharing that weren't accessible um still pretty much aren't it was kind of a new thing a new technology and people with disabilities weren't really considered um we've had some similar things in pittsburgh um related to um trying to increase where bike lanes are or different things like that and they went ahead and made some changes and didn't think that they were removing either accessible parking spots or made it so that the person, um, like the curb ramp was blocked or um, you know, just made things a little bit more difficult for people with disabilities because they were trying to improve um, the city for people who ride bikes. So um, it was, I, I think that's the, the biggest thing is that when decisions and changes are being made to make sure that people with disabilities have um, some inputs and, and can voice their concerns of how that might affect them. Thank you. Also, Tom, I mean, the big one thing is, is common is uh, talk to people with disabilities. It still happens to be in restaurants where, where people, the uh, waiter or waitress will talk to my uh, wife and ask me what I want to eat, you know, which is a, you know, subtle, subtle form of discrimination and uh so you know just learning those things also what everybody can do is talk directly to the person right and ask them what they can do um from pittsburgh pittsburgh's i would say both uh the topographically challenged and historically challenged right the the hillsides and then the fact that there's many older districts but that means for all of us, whenever we see new construction taking place, uh, to uh, to make come, you know, make make note and ask it to be accessible. And for those people that are on the call or participating in the meeting that don't have a disability or do have a disability, it also helps if you go into a a, a store or a restaurant or place that has a step or uh, that you. You make you make a note, and you know you have a step, and that makes it difficult for people to get inside, or you don't have an accessible bathroom, or yes. you have you thought about making your uh, your menu accessible on an app or a web so that people with uh, visual impairments or hearing impairments can access it. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um. I'm going to actually go off of the um, I, the script, if you will, that we had put together because we're starting to get a few questions in, and I'd like I'd like to put this out to the panel. Uh, please, please speak to the importance of activism with disabled community and what are pressing issues today. So again, please speak to the importance of activism with disabled community and what are pressing issues. I think everybody on this panel. Go ahead, Dr. Cooper. Go ahead. Yeah, Let me list a few. Employment remains a huge barrier still. Yes. Um, as we transition to on-demand and perhaps even autonomous transportation to make it sure it's accessible. Um, and, and as we transition, as we are now, to this hybrid education to make sure that there are the support systems in place mm -hmm. for people with disabilities of all ages, especially school-age children. Anybody else? Chas? I, th I think it's important. Um, thanks, Dr. Cooper. Those are some great uh, items. I think every panelist is going to have something that pulls at their heartstrings. With that being said, I just want to encourage people to do something. So I want people to be active and engaged in something that is passionate and important to them. So if you're on this, if you're participating today and you love animals, 
animal rights is something that you can advocate and be a part of. If you have a family member with any sort of disability, um, donating your time, your resources, a dollar to a cause helps the work. But having a voice in that movement also is important. And one thing I, I also, for me personally, it's about making sure that we have trained, motivated, educated young people to come after all of us to fill in. So we, you know, we talked a little bit about history and there were some remarkable folks that were mentioned that started this movement. And we on this panel have continued the movement. I'm very much interested in who's next. I want to be able to step aside and enjoy life and all it has to offer. And I want to make sure that the foundation is built to make sure that we're handing it off to uh, young folks to follow that can, that can keep the movement going. So I think that is part of our activation and work. Thank you. Others? John? I would also add that um, making sure that um, things aren't going to go backwards. Um, I know mm -hmm. Congress uh, just the last year or, or two years ago, there was talk and I think even a bill was presented um, about stripping some of the, um, mm -hmm. the rights of the ADA that it would basically say no business would have to be accessible until like six months after they were sued. So right now, if, if, a, if a business is sued, and they're found to be inaccessible, then you know they can, um, you know, be charged uh, a fine or, or different things like that, and, and be forced to be made accessible. Um, but uh, the the new bill was basically saying uh, that no building ever had to be accessible until somebody sued them, um, which which makes mm -hmm. it that much more difficult for people with disabilities because yes. in order to have their community be accessible, they have to basically sue every business. Um, so I, I think that some of that was, uh, you know, there's some activism when things like that pop up to make sure that, uh, things aren't going to go backwards. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I also think, you know, activism is a, a very good thing. And, you know, as we can see in the world today, there's a lot of it going on. Um, and we just need to, uh, like Chaz said, find something that we're passionate about. Um, and, you know, make sure that we're, we're doing something about it, whether it's joining a group or donating money or donating time. Um, I think that's, that's something that's great about uh, our country and our world is that we, we all have the ability to do those types of things and try to make it better. Thank you. Others? Yes. So to kind of like go off of Chaz's statement, um, that's kind of how I got into activism. Like I said before, I'm only 20 years old. I was brought into activism by older individuals with neuromuscular diseases and by the university for the issues that I've brought up in the past. And I think right about now we're in a phase where we really need to kind of like drum up support from other groups. Um, I've been trying to do so by bringing my friend group into activism any way that I can, bringing clubs I'm into into activism like the uh, parliamentary debate team. A lot of those individuals are pol political science majors, so they're more than on board with um, getting into any sort of activism. So I think right about now, it's just kind of like us as individuals with disabilities have to reach out to those around us to kind of like get them into activism to help us get done what we need to get done. And I think to go off of what Jonathan said, it would definitely be nice if we could as a country create a different avenue of getting businesses to become accessible that doesn't require taking legal action. Right. So I guess that would be a major um, right. goal. Yes. Okay. I think another area of definite um, observation and uh, continued need of activism is healthcare and the quality and the accessibility of it for individuals with disabilities. Um, in recent years, the um, country has, because of the political climate and um, the agenda um, of certain individuals, um, healthcare for individuals with disabilities has come under attack. Um, and 
they're sending quote unquote threats to take it away if you have a pre existing condition. Well, that we're all going to, like Dr. Cooper has said, and John and others, everybody at some point is going to acquire a disability or a pre existing condition. So I think while the conversation has shifted and it's not as much of an active um, need for activism at the current moment. I think we can't afford to back down or walk away from the um, need for activism around healthcare and accessibility of it. Um, Because as we've seen with, like John mentioned, the um, underhanded kind of repeal attempts at repealing the ADA um, or pieces of it anyways. Um, the government is still continuing to um, subtly try to change the way healthcare is offered for individuals with disabilities. And to me, that's a vital issue because we all need healthcare because we all need to stay well and be active individuals in society. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, go ahead, Andrea. Following up on what uh, what uh, what everybody has just said, in that, uh, and activism is critically important. But one thing that uh, each and every one of you who is um, watching this Zoom meeting can do is inform yourself. Uh, about the candidates who are running in your elections, whether it's local or state or national, and find out how uh, what their positions are relative to all the things we've been talking about. And yes, be activists, but also vote. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have, again, we have about 10 minutes left now. I have a couple more questions from our audience that I'd like to put out. And um, the first one is, what recommendations do you have for Pitt or individuals to educate the general public? Any ideas how to reach the public? And actually, that was a question that we had on our original list or something similar to that. So again, what recommendations do you have for Pitt or individuals to educate the general public? Um, I know something I've like reiterated to my friend group and like people I know a lot is in order for us to get this information out there, we need help from higher up organizations to do so. So we need Pitt to send out in the Pitt emails information on disability activism on the ADA to educate their students and their faculty. We need the government and like the media to start publicizing more what's going on in disability advo advocacy. Like we need groups with more influence to start helping us spread the information that we're talking about here. Thank you. Others? I think it's important that we work together collaboratively. Um, I'm looking to work with um, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, uh, Pitt and CLAD and leadership um, to create an employee resource group around disability. So we're bringing all types of disabilities together to really make some change at Pitt. And we have to think about disability broad perspective, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we can't just think about those with physical disabilities. We have to think about all types of disabilities from all walks of life and really work collaboratively to make some progress and change. Thank you. John, Andrea, Libby, anybody else, Rory? Um, sure. I actually think Chaz brings up a great point. Mm -hmm. um, there are actually a lot of similarities in um, what would benefit people with disabilities, would benefit all faculty, staff, and students, especially other underrepresented groups. You know, if, you, if I use an architectural example, you know, curb cuts help people with wheelchairs, but they help mothers with strollers and young children and older adults and delivery people. And, you know, you think about um, having uh, what we've called, you know, assisted bathrooms or family bathrooms is also good for, uh, well, personally, my experience is everybody would prefer a private bathroom over a 
just a flimsy stall and that COVID-19 that even becomes more important. And, uh, um, but also, you know, you could, if you create something that works for people with disabilities, it probably also works for lactating mothers. Um, it also helps to solve people who yes. are non-binary and their uh, gender orientation. Or, and so, um, and then frankly, there's a lot of commonalities. The people disabilities rights movement is for decades worked with the uh, African American uh, Hispanic groups and women to find common ground to increase uh, inclusion and accessibility. And we need to do the same thing within our academic community. Yes, thank you. I'm going to interject and I'm going to um, segue from something Dr. Cooper just mentioned, the, the pandemic we're in right now with COVID-19. There was a question that came up, what challenges have arisen um, with COVID in the disabled community? I think this is a very important question that we talk about at this particular time. Um, I think for a lot of us, like with disabilities comes um, for some of us, pre-existing conditions that make us especially susceptible to the virus. Like I'm very well aware of the fact that since my disability, a neuromuscular disease um, severely affects my respiratory system, I would more than likely not have a fighting chance against this virus. So with people not following mask protocols, not following six feet apart, just not taking it as seriously as they could, they could pass it on to someone like me or to someone who has to, um, who has to be a caregiver for someone like me, because I do hire twenty four seven personal care assistants to basically stay alive. So I think a lot of it is like a safety issue, at least for me. Yes, thank you. Others, please. Libby, I think you're. We need to unmute you. Thank I think. You, <laughs> I think the other significant issue that the pandemic has kind of made diff more difficult is the feelings of isolation and um, depression for individuals with disabilities because they're more isolated um, because of the need, of course, for to stay healthy and to prevent um, contracting COVID-19. But I think it also puts us at greater risk for loneliness and um, isolation because we're already an isolated, um, segregated population. Um, so that just, so the pandemic um, has just kind of exacerbated the um, feelings of isolation and um, kind of forgetting uh, the invisibility of our population within the greater community. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I think there's been also, you know, several um, things that the, the um, pandemic has brought up that um, you don't really think of at first, like I, I'd mentioned, sometimes when new things pop up, uh, accessibility or disability is an afterthought. Um, you know, we want everyone to wear masks, but um, that can really hurt communication, especially with somebody um, that lip reads or something. So I've seen a lot of people designing masks that are clear, um, so you could still see the people's lips moving. Um, so in, in some ways, it sparks innovation when something like this happens. Um, we've also, you know, a, I guess a kind of another benefit is um, so many people are working from home that it's kind of proven to employers that if somebody with a disability can do the job, but they, you know, request to work from home a few days a week, um, a lot of employers have said, well, this job can't be done working from home. And this is kind of proof that a lot of jobs can be done working from home. Um, and then I guess kind of another negative that I've seen is, you know, when the hospitals or, or clinics were kind of shutting down to what they considered elective procedures because they were worried about surges on the hospital of COVID-19. A lot of people with disabilities, you know, might have more health um, health concerns that they would go to a doctor or go to a hospital more often than the general population. And 
Um, some of them were not going because they they were afraid of getting the virus if they went, or they just weren't able to go because um, a lot of those um, what were considered elective that weren't really elective were were not happening. Yeah, to kind of go off what Jonathan said, because that's a really good point. I would just like to remind everyone of the um, major injustice against people with disabilities that happened when COVID was kind of overwhelming hospitals. Um, that's through the ventilator crisis, uh, which was more of a global issue where people, again, like me, who utilize um, non-invasive ventilation to assist with breathing at time, that was at risk and people were worried that that would be taken away from them in some parts of the country or in some parts of the world. Um, other issues was protocols that stated that um, people with pre-existing conditions, again, like neuromuscular disease and a bunch of other disabilities um, would not get priority treatment and would actually, they would um, prioritize able-bodied people above disabled people, uh, people with disabilities if the hospital was overwhelmed with resources. So that's an excellent point that Jonathan made with the um, virus that I would kind of just like to bring up again that that actually happened once our country was being overwhelmed with the virus. Thank you. Anybody else as we kind of bring things, we're almost at the top of the hour now, but anybody else like to add anything to this conversation right here? Libby, we have you muted again. Um, I think another difficult situation that the pandemic had put people into is individuals with disabilities often require attendance, et cetera, to help with their daily uh, living needs. And if they were to become ill, um, not just with COVID-19, but with other illness and require hospitalization, they were, were unable to have a personal care attendant or a family member um, be with them. A lot of hospitals, because of COVID-19, reduced their visitor pause. Uh, policies um, to restrict them. And thankfully, though, what eventually came out of it is a lot of advocacy and activism around that issue. And um, a lot of the federal government finally stepped in and um, told hospitals that they could not um, forbid um, a personal care attendant or a family member um, for being with their uh, loved one who was in the hospital. Thank you. Well, we are at uh, the Tom, top of the hour. Is, go ahead, Dr. Cooper, please, go ahead. This is Lori. The other thing is a lot of people with disabilities rely on public transportation, yes. which itself yes. can put them at risk uh, during COVID-19. Yes, thank you. We could talk all day. And literally about about things. We we need another hour or more here, but unfortunately, we have reached the top of the hour. And um, and I apologize to some of the people um, in our audience that we maybe didn't get to their questions. So I apologize for that. But I want to thank Dr. Cooper and Andrea Shelby, Jonathan, uh, Chaz, Libby, um, Heather, and Matt. Thank you so much for your insights. Um, this was just wonderful today that we had an opportunity to have this conversation about the Americans with Disabilities Act. So thank you to one and all and um, best wishes moving forward. Thank you everyone. Thank you Tom for moderating today. Thank you, sir.